Hello once again. Welcome back to this session number four of the Family Federation True Love Seminar, the short version. Uh, restoration is our topic. In the last session, we explained more fully my dream and the importance of human responsibility, especially when it comes to love. We learn that the desire to find true parents is not only our dream, it was God's dream. It was a dream that motivated God to create. The first man and woman had fulfilled their responsibility for love. If they had put God's happiness first in their hearts, they would have grown to become God's mature filial son and filial daughter. Having accomplished that, they would have received God's blessing on their marriage, and through that marriage, they would have experienced the joy of romantic sexual love and the joy of becoming parents. This family would have been God's family, and from this family, a peaceful world would have been realized. In this world, God, humanity, and all of creation would have been filled with the greatest joy. In addition, we introduce the analogy of the healthy seed bringing forth a healthy tree. The one thing that will be determine the nature of a tree is its seed. If the male and female components of the seed are healthy, the seed will be healthy and it will produce a healthy tree. But as we all know, that is not what happened. The first man and first woman did not fulfill their responsibility when it comes to love. Instead of maintaining a filial heart towards God, they pursued the path of self-centered love. They allowed the force of premature romantic sexual love to consume them and separate them from God. This is why today, instead of living the dream, we find ourselves in a nightmare. From this point, we're going to look at our third topic, restoration. It will address the question, how do we escape from the nightmare and fulfill the dream? To answer this question, we will continue with our analogy of the seed and the tree it produces. When we look at the human family tree, and we see that every branch is dominated by self-centered love, and we see that there is conflict everywhere, between nations, within nations, within society, within families, and even in each individual, we quickly realize that the origin of this problem must go back to the very beginning, to the origin, to the seed, right? As was explained, the seed of the human family, which was a union of the first man and woman, was not rooted in true love. It was rooted in self-centered love. Then what's the solution? How does restoration take place? How do we change the human family tree into the heavenly tree that God and all of us have been dreaming of? And the answer is, there's no way for that to happen. Anyone who knows basic biology will know that you can't change a tree that has already sprouted from a corrupt seed, a seed that has grown for thousands of years. That tree's identity will never change. This explains a lot. It explains why every attempt to fix this world keeps falling short. Revolutions, wars, changing our leadership, changing the laws, hiring more police, giving out welfare and charity, changing methods of education, prescribing drugs and then more drugs, and so on and so on. Although some things have helped to a degree, overall problems keep growing. This explains why as time goes by and as this tree gets bigger and bigger, things seem to get worse and worse. So does that mean there's no hope? No. The good news is that there is hope. There is a solution. And it's actually not so complicated. Would you like to know what that solution is? So I think this deserves another drum roll. Okay, so drum roll, please. 
Okay. The solution is plant a new seed. That's right. Plant a new seed. That means God needs to send a new Adam and a new Eve, a couple who fulfill their responsibility for love by aligning their hearts with God's heart and in so doing become the healthy seed that the first couple failed to become. In other words, become the true parents. Become the dream. Then, from that couple, a healthy tree, God's family of true love, can grow. And once that happens, there will be two trees, one rooted in God's love and one rooted in fallen love. From this point, those who are living as children of the old fallen tree, if they choose to, they can cut themselves off from that tree and graft themselves onto the new tree. This is how the world can change. And through this process, eventually, when all of God's children return home, the old fallen tree is just going to fade away. Then, the peaceful world God dreamed of, the world we all long for, will finally be realized. That's God's plan. Now the question becomes, who is this couple? Who is this new Adam and new Eve? In the Christian faith, the man is called the Messiah. The woman is referred to as the Messiah's bride. We can find this in the book of Revelation 19.7, where it says, The wedding of the Lamb, the Lamb being a symbol of the coming Messiah, has come, and his bride has made herself ready. We find this at the end of the Bible. It's describing what will happen when evil finally comes to an end. Another terminology that is used in Scripture for the new Adam is God's only begotten Son. This terminology is to help us understand that the Messiah is a special person. He is special in that his birth belongs to God. He does not come from the fallen family tree. But a seed cannot sprout if there is not the feminine element. This is what, until now, has not been understood. If there is an only begotten son, there must also be God's only begotten daughter. Doesn't that make sense? The seed of the human family must begin with the unity of God's son and God's daughter. This is the meaning of true parents. This is the missing truth that Jesus wanted to convey, but was unable to do so due to his rejection and his early death on the cross. Now, Let's ask the question that must be on everyone's mind. If what has been said is really God's plan, to send his only begotten son and only begotten daughter into this world in order to create his family tree of true love, then why didn't that happen a long time ago? If God is truly our heavenly parent who loves us, wouldn't he want to save us as quickly as possible? This is a good question. First, the answer is yes. God, our Heavenly Parent, does truly love us, every one of us. In fact, He loves us more than we love ourselves. Because this is true, God's heart is in deep pain because of our situation. This is a painting from Jesus' parable, The Prodigal Son. It shows the love of the Father for His Son, who, after committing many sins, returns home to repent. And here's a quote from one of Mother Moon's prayers. It reveals God's painful heart after losing his children. Our God, you lost humankind, your family. As you pushed your way through history, you must have been like a traumatized parent who had lost his senses, his entire being in shambles. You are not a God of joy and glory. You are a heartsick parent filled with mourning and sorrow over your lost children. From this point going forward, you must not forget God's parental heart, the heart that is desperate to save his children. But here we need to go back to our question. If God loves us, why didn't he send his new son and daughter right from the beginning? 
And the answer to this question lies in understanding the nature of evil and the fallen world. Before God can plant a new seed, he first must find a place to plant it. If the soil is too toxic, the seed will die. This is a photo of an apple seed. Imagine if all the apple trees in the world died and all the apple seeds became rotten and you have the only one remaining healthy apple seed. Wouldn't it be precious? How would you plant it? Would you just throw it out the window or on the side of the road and hope that it sprouts and grows? I don't think so. You would prepare a special plot of soil for it. You would check the soil to make sure it had no toxins that would kill the seed, and you would make sure no insect or bird would come and eat it. The nature of evil, which comes from self-centered love, is to destroy the good. That's the problem God has been facing. If God sends His only begotten Son and His only begotten daughter into this world, what do you think the world will do to them? What did Cain do when he realized his brother was closer to God than him? He killed him. What did the people do to the prophets of history whom God sent, who spoke out against the evil of their time? They killed them. What did they do to Jesus when he tried to guide the people back to God? They killed him. What did they do to Gandhi when he attempted to bring an end to the fighting between Hindus and Muslims and bring them closer to God? They killed him. And what did they do to Martin Luther King Jr. when he tried to help the nation overcome racism and bring us all closer to God? They killed him. If God sends his son and daughter to this world, God knows that this world is going to reject and kill them. This means, before God can send his son and daughter to this world, he must first raise up a prepared people who can receive and welcome them and protect them from the evil of the fallen world. This became the first step in God's strategy to save his children. But this first step, to prepare a people who would receive his son and daughter, proved to be very difficult. To help us understand how God has worked, with fallen people to raise up a prepared people, we're going to introduce one of God's most basic principles. We call it the principle of human responsibility. It works like this. God's will can only be accomplished if two things happen. First, God must fulfill his responsibility. And second, the people God is working with must fulfill their responsibility for love. If the people choose to align their hearts with God, it is good, and God's will will be fulfilled. But if God's people choose to turn their hearts away from God, it is evil, and God's will will be blocked. In this short introductory seminar, we don't have enough time to walk through and explain each episode in history in which God attempted to prepare a people who would be able to receive his son and daughter. But at least, let's take a look, a brief look, at his first attempt. After Adam and Eve fell, God worked with their two sons, Cain and Abel. Through them, God wanted to prepare a place where he could send his son and daughter. For that to happen, God needed Cain not to kill Abel. That was God's will. God did his part when he spoke to Cain letting him know that if he chose to do well, to do what was right, he too would be blessed. Cain's responsibility was to not kill Abel. But what happened? Cain chose not to listen to God's voice, and he murdered his younger brother, Abel. This is how God's first attempt to prepare people failed. 2,000 biblical years after Cain and Abel, God would call on Abraham. In this diagram, he's up on the left. Abraham, who's known as a father of faith. We talked about him before in the first session. And from Abraham, it would take another 2,000 years before God would be able to send his son Jesus. This is because time after time, 
the people God called refused to fulfill their responsibility for love. At the time of Moses, at the time of the kings of Israel, at the time of the prophets, God's will was blocked again and again. Finally, through his work with the descendants of Abraham, God was able to find special people of faith through whom he could work and bring about the birth of his son Jesus. They were Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, Elizabeth, her cousin, and Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, the priest. He was called by the angel Gabriel. And also Zechariah and Elizabeth's son, whose name was John. He would become a great prophet known as John the Baptist. He was the one God called on to testify to the people that Jesus was the Son of God. These people were special, not only because of their faith in God, but because they were all shown by heaven that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. With the hope that they would provide the environment and protection that Jesus needed, God sent Jesus into this world. Jesus came with a mission that no one fully understood. Jesus knew that the only way to save humanity was to find God's only begotten daughter, and together with her become the true parent, the new seed that would be able to create God's family and fulfill God's dream. The problem was, when Jesus attempted to teach God's will to the people, they rejected him. When those who were close to Jesus were unable or unwilling to support him, Jesus attempted to raise up his own disciples and through them create the support he needed to fulfill his work. But in the end, no one remained faithful. Judas betrayed him for money, and Peter, his first disciple, betrayed him because of his lack of faith. Three times Peter denied that he had ever known Jesus. This is why Jesus went to the cross, and it is why he was unable to reveal the deepest truths that were in his heart. Let's read once again the words of Jesus right, that we read in the first session from John 16, 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The many things Jesus was unable to share, these are the missing truths that we've been studying in this seminar as revealed through Father and Mother Moon. And this is why Jesus said he would have to come again. For what purpose does the Messiah need to come again? Let's read this passage from Revelation one more time. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Jesus needed to come again in order to fulfill the marriage of the Lamb, to find God's daughter, to establish the position of true parents, and create the family of God that is able to save all humanity. But before God could send a new Messiah, before he could bring his daughter into this world, once again he would need to prepare people who would be able to receive them. This was God's will. But as before, to accomplish this was very difficult. It required that people fulfill their responsibility for love. And this is why it took another 2,000 years. The people God called were those who were moved by Jesus' sacrifice and who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to spread the good news that God's Son was going to return. From that point, the Christian faith began to grow and expand. But despite the fact that there have been many great Christian saints, there were also many failures. Just as it was when God tried to prepare the descendants of Abraham to receive Jesus, so also Christian history brought great pain to God's heart. To give just one example, in the 1600s, 8 million Christians died in the Thirty Years' War between Catholic Christians and Protestant Christians. Can you imagine that? This war was waged because a German priest named Martin Luther tried to end the corruption in the church. 
he began what is known as the Reformation. A few decades later, John Calvin took the Reformation to a new level when he published his writings on theology, writings that would inspire a new movement in Christianity. That movement was called the Puritan Movement. The Puritans played a special role in God's effort to prepare a world that would be able to receive his son and daughter. They were the ones who came to America seeking religious and later political freedom. Based on their faith and sacrificial investment, God was able to bless America. To be sure, America has many faults. It has made many mistakes. To mention just a few, the scourge of slavery, the abuse of the American Indians, and later, the rise of materialism, and eventually the promotion of things like free sex and other kind of decadent things that have emerged. So yes, there's a lot of mistakes. But when we consider that 2,000 years ago, Jesus was put to death because of his religious teachings, America is the nation God prepared for this time. America became the nation that supported God's effort to prepare a people who would protect religious freedom, and in doing so create an environment that would protect the coming Messiah and God's daughter. On three critical occasions, America prevented evil from dominating the world. In World War I, centered on the Kaiser of the German Empire. In World War II, centered on Hitler and the fascist powers. And when, after World War II, the communist powers attempted to force their atheistic revolution on the world. In Mother Moon's words, if America collapsed, God would have no place to stand. Now, what comes next? What comes next is God's work to save humanity through the second coming of the Messiah and his only begotten daughter. Which brings us to the next question. Who is the Messiah and who is God's daughter? One way to approach this question is to look to the advice that Jesus gave. In Matthew 7:16, Jesus expressed his concern that we might follow after false prophets. In doing so, he gave us a piece of wisdom. He taught us, you will know them by their fruits. This is an important insight by telling us that we must look carefully at the fruits in order to discern if someone is of God or not of God. Jesus is telling us that it's not going to be obvious who is God's representative. We know in the case of Jesus that people weren't able to tell that he was God's son just by looking at him. He didn't float down from heaven on a cloud, and he didn't have a golden halo hanging above his head. The same is true for all of God's representatives. In other words, Jesus is telling us that we're going to have to make effort if we want to find God's son and daughter. This is the portion of responsibility that God wants us to fulfill. Then, if it is true that we will know them by their fruits, what is the most important fruit we should be looking for in the coming Messiah and in God's daughter? To answer that question, let's go back to the beginning of our seminar. The key to making a better world lies in discovering the missing truth. As was explained, over the last few centuries, science has given us the external truth we need so that everyone can live happily. But even though this is true, humanity is suffering and appears to be headed towards self-destruction. Why is that? It's because despite the development of internal truth, through history, it has been lacking a key element. This means that one of the most important fruits we should be looking for as we seek to find the Messiah and God's daughter is this missing internal truth. We need the truth that can enable people to change their hearts. And so the question becomes, what is this truth that we should be looking for? And the answer is, first, this truth must reveal to us the dream that exists within God's heart, the same dream that God planted in each of us. This is the dream that was to be fulfilled 
when the first man and first woman became true parents by growing to become one with God's heart of true love. It's a dream that all people of the world can live together in peace as one family under God. Next, this truth must reveal to us human responsibility for making the dream come true. And most importantly, this is the truth that must reveal how the first man and woman went off the track of God's true love and created a family tree dominated by self-centered love. And finally, this truth must reveal God's plan for restoration and the fulfillment of his dream. It must reveal his plan to send a new Adam, his only begotten son, and a new Eve, his only begotten daughter. It must explain the true essence of Jesus' mission, that he came to find God's daughter. And it must reveal how God is working today to bring the second coming of the Messiah and the birth of his daughter. This is the very truth that we've been learning in this seminar. It is a truth that God revealed to Father and Mother Moon. This is a fruit that they bring to the world, and it is the fruit that you have been invited to listen to and to examine in this seminar, to see if it's a good fruit or a bad fruit. And there's another fruit that the returning Messiah and God's daughter must show to the world. It is not enough for them to reveal the spoken and written truth. They must accomplish that truth in their lives. In other words, they must become true parents who love humanity as God loves humanity. In 1935, Father Moon was called by Jesus to do what Jesus was unable to do. And in 1943, Hak Jahan was born into this world as God's only begotten daughter. Heaven brought them together, and in 1960, they received God's blessing on their marriage. Their marriage was not a normal marriage. They did not marry for themselves. They did not marry for their personal happiness. They married with just one desire in their hearts, to end God's suffering by becoming the true parents who are able to plant the seed of God's family tree and open a way for humanity to come back home to God. The ceremony they have overseen that makes this transition from the fallen family tree to God's family tree possible is called the blessing. It began with their blessing, and since that time it has grown and expanded. This is a photo of the 1992 blessing that was held at the Olympic Stadium in Seoul, South Korea. At that event, 30,000 couples from around the world, from every religious background, from every ethnicity, receive God's blessing on their marriages. We encourage you to learn more about the blessing and the content that has been shared in this seminar. The key to changing the world, what we've called the missing truth, lies in finding God as our true parent, and ultimately in our each becoming a true parent. If you are single and maybe not yet thinking about marriage, that's fine. We encourage you to get involved with others who are single, who are preparing themselves to receive God's blessing on their future marriage. The good news is that the doorway, the doorway has been opened through which we can work together to build God's family on this earth. I think this is very exciting. So we will conclude this seminar here. It's been my great privilege to share with you this good news. And although Father Moon has passed on to the spiritual world, Mother Moon, God's only begotten daughter, is still with us. Every day she is doing all she can do to ensure that each of us is able to grow in true love, create a family of true love, and together with her build a world of true love. So God bless you, and thank you so much for being a part of this seminar.